the subject is where is the kingdom of God? It could equally be what is the kingdom of God? The Pharisees had a question for our Lord. When should it come? Of course, they expected the wrong thing. Their teaching was that when Messiah came, he would bring a political kingdom. He would bring conquest over the Roman occupying armies and evict them. He would restore the fortunes of Israel and there would be great triumph and some would teach even world domination by the Jewish people. They thought there would be tremendous political reformation. They didn't understand. They had twisted the teaching of the scripture. They didn't understand the prophecies of old, which indicate that it would be a spiritual kingdom. It would be a kingdom in which people had their sins forgiven and were reconciled with God, entering thereby into his kingdom and knowing everlasting life. But they asked him when was their kind of kingdom with all its conquest and its prosperity on earth, when was it coming? It was, of course, a trap question. Some people say it was asked mockingly and imperiously. I expect they're right. Can't be absolutely sure. But it was a taunting kind of question. If he would answer saying, it comes in the future, then, of course, they would appear to make him contradict himself because he was presented as the Messiah. And if the coming of the great kingdom is in the future, then he cannot be that Messiah. If, on the other hand, he said now, then he would be saying very explicitly that he was the Messiah and they could take offense at him and seek to have him charged for blasphemy. So they're trying to provoke this kind of an answer. But always, when they taxed him with these questions before the crowds, different questions, cunningly framed, always he confounded them. And amazingly, and the answer he gave would be totally unexpected to them. And yet it would be an answer so helpful to people in those days and ever since. And so it is here. He gives an answer which accomplishes two things at once. It confounds the Pharisees. It makes them look small and inadequate before the crowds of people. And yet it educates. It tells us something about the kingdom and its nature. What it is. What is the kingdom of God? Where is the kingdom of God? And in a few simple words, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us and explains it. His words actually have a dual meaning, but they come as a surprise and a shock, and they educate and help. So in the short time, let's look at these. When he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So first of all, he says, it will not be observed. It will not come with outward show. It is not an earthly kingdom. It is not an earthly political kingdom. It's not a physical conquest. It's not like that, the kingdom of God, he says. It will not be announced as some sort of phenomenon, as though it's accomplished by battles. See here, see there, see what's been accomplished here. This mighty victory, that mighty victory won't come like that at all, he says. It's not announced with multiple sights because look, he says, see, behold. And I imagine that as he said this, he pointed, perhaps rather vaguely, but towards them. See, he said, observe, it is within you. The kingdom of God is among you. And the sense means this, it's here already. Didn't you know? The kingdom of God is already operating on earth. It's in your midst. It's in individuals, but not all individuals. 
That's what it means. It's among you. Of course, there were disciples. There were believers. There were people there who believed in the mercy of God and sought forgiveness from him and obtained salvation from him and life and spiritual life and loved him and walked with him. They were in the kingdom, you see. See, observe, the kingdom of God is among you. But it's a very clear way of saying it doesn't include all of you. You are not all in it. It's not only among you, but it's something that is within the person, within the heart, the soul of individuals. That's the kingdom of God. They didn't understand it, but his teaching is very clear and it's very profound. It's in your midst, it's in individuals. Not all Jews, not all people, but those who have sought and found the Lord. He seems to say to them, are you in it? He doesn't say this, but his words are a challenge. They're not only information, they challenge. The kingdom of God is within you, among you. And the people listening, even the Pharisees, would inevitably think, well, I am, is he saying, I am in it, or I am out of it? I may not be in this. It isn't the totality of us. It's only some of us, and that's very challenging. They asked, when? He answered where it was, not when it would come, and he caught them out, but he gives them solid and important information. The kingdom of God, it is not of this world. It is not a material kingdom, yet it is the largest kingdom. The kingdom of God has been represented on earth since the beginning of time. The kingdom of God has drawn in seekers after God and converts throughout the world in every land and nation down the running centuries for generations. Earthly empires rise and fall. They last for a season. They may be mighty empires, but they only had in them the people that were alive for their period of existence. The kingdom of God may often seem to be in different lands, a small minority of people. But when you add them all up, across the decades, the generations, the rolling centuries, in total, it will turn out to be the biggest kingdom, the biggest empire in the world. It's certainly the most powerful because it conquers hearts. Force of arms can subdue nations and bring them down and rule them with a rod of iron. But the kingdom of God is a conquest in hearts, people who seek God's love and mercy, people who are brought to him and find him and love him and walk with him. It's a kingdom of reconciliation with God, and it's so powerful. Much greater is the work to turn hearts and change people than to simply humble them and subdue, subdue them with arms, with weapons. Oh, dear friends, the kingdom of God, the largest, the mightiest of kingdoms. And yet, in a sense, it's an invisible kingdom because it is a spiritual kingdom. So I'd like to talk just briefly about kingdom. What is meant by the kingdom of God? Now, you know that every kingdom in the world and in the history of the world is by nature a domain. I don't mean a domain in the sense uh, of the internet and websites, not that, that's a rather feeble misuse of the term domain. Domain, a domain is a realm belonging to a ruler. The world is filled with domain, domains, realms that belong to rule. It comes from French. And so is the kingdom of God. It's a distinct, defined people who walk with the Lord and know him and love him. God has his own subjects, but it's not everyone. I remember a couple of examples, both of these, 
uh, no disrespect to the United States of America, but both of these involve America. A lot of American troops were lost in an aircraft crash some years ago. And the president on television said that now they were all in heaven. Similarly, a number of GIs, troops lost their lives when a garrison guarding a, an embassy was stormed overseas. And the then president said they were in heaven. How did he know that? I don't want to criticize him. He probably meant well by what he said, but it was a foolish thing to say because the Lord Jesus Christ, the savior of the world, said that the kingdom of heaven is a special domain and a distinctive domain of those people who have sought him and found his forgiving love and walk with him and trust in him. It isn't everybody. The kingdom of God is within you. It is among you. These are the authoritative words of Christ. It isn't all of you. Are you in it? Or are you outside it? That's a very solemn and a challenging question. The kingdom of God. Let's say some things about the kingdom of God. How would we define it? First of all, the kingdom of God is a rule. It is the people, the distinctive people, who have placed themselves under the rule of God. It's a rule. The people in the kingdom of God are people who try to obey. That's not what got them in, obedience. They were once rebels. They were once enemies of God. But they were humbled by the work of the Spirit, by the work of God. And they saw that they were outsiders, shut out of the kingdom, shut out of heaven. And they came to believe in God's mercy, that a saviour had come, Jesus Christ, God himself, second person of the Trinity, to suffer in the place of people who repented and believed in him. And those people who trust in Christ for salvation and yield their lives to him, they are brought by the mercy and grace of God into the kingdom. Those are the people who are in and they bow to the rule of God and they pledge themselves to be loyal to him. All rebels once, but they became repentant sinners and they longed to know him and they sincerely went on their knees before God and said, Lord, forgive me and bring me in to the kingdom of Christ. I believe in him and what he's done. I have nothing to deserve this blessing. I can do nothing, but I desire a free salvation purchased by Christ when he died for sinners. And that's how we come under the rule of God. The kingdom of God is also a conquest. Now I've been saying it isn't a conquest, certainly not by arms, but it is a conquest in a sense. Most kingdoms at some time or other, not all, but most, came into being by conquest. And so is the kingdom of God, oddly enough, a conquest. But it's a conquest of hearts. Here's a human heart. I want my life for myself. It's stubborn. It will not yield to God. It pretends to be not interested. Rejects the Lord won't listen to this message. And then the Lord begins to work in the heart. And that person realizes, yes, but I'm a condemned sinner. I need the forgiveness of God. I must be accepted into the kingdom of God. I must be forgiven. And you come to humble yourself and to trust him and to call upon him and to ask him. And he brings you in. Your heart has been conquered, conquered by the love of Christ conquered by the realization that he went all the way to Calvary's cross to redeem you, to take your sins in your place so that you could be set free. And the love of Christ and what he's done for sinners conquers your heart and you find yourself humbled to the dust. And that's how you come in. So it is, in a sense, a conquest, but of love, taking hearts, the kingdom of God involves nationality too. Just like any kingdom, you become a national, a loyal citizen. 
You have nationality. You bear the likeness of that nation. In the kingdom of God, we bear the likeness of the king. We're not exactly like Christ, but we begin to be something like him because we know him and he changes us. And the violent person becomes a gentle person and the liar becomes a much more honest person and the proud person becomes a humbler person and the hostile, disagreeable, selfish person is changed. Why, this is a matter of having the kingdom likeness stamped upon us. God works wonderfully in the hearts of those who come to him. The kingdom of God is a language and a culture. You learn the language, almost dare I say, the language of heaven. You learn the language that God likes. You learn about God. You learn the doctrines of God. You learn about his plans and his ways and his mind and his standards. Oh, you are shaped and you learn to pray the language of the kingdom of God. And every day you pray and God answers your prayers. Don't believe anybody who says that God does not answer prayer. If you come to him and your sins are forgiven and your life is changed, you're converted to God, he hears your prayers. Not maybe your selfish prayers, Lord, make me rich. Lord, make me the boss. Lord, give me the things I desire, whether they're good for me or not. But he hears your earnest and your sensible and your godly prayers and your prayers for other people. And he answers you constantly. And you have this tremendous body of evidence and proof that he is your God. Are you outside the kingdom? Have you never had prayers substantially answered? Not just a possible coincidence, but a stream of indications that you're a child of God. And he is your God. And he hears you. And he responds to you. Oh, dear friends, there's a language and a culture in the kingdom of God, and you're brought into it. It's a place of education. You learn about him. You have your mind opened to the things you discover. I never thought it, but years ago, when I was a youngster, when I came to Christ, into the kingdom of God, suddenly I thought at first this was about the forgiveness of my sin, which I needed. This was about receiving a new life and a new nature, which I needed. This was about having a destiny in eternity and heaven with God, with the Lord, which I needed. But I never realized that with it came the dispelling of ignorance and so much understanding and discernment about the world, why we're here, what the future plans of God are, all these things are revealed in the scripture. But before I was in the kingdom of Christ, before I was converted, I didn't understand them. They didn't mean anything to me. Now they became plain. And even a youngster, everyone who comes into the kingdom understands deep and profound and great things about God's purposes and the world and how, why people behave as they do. Our education is so made up. Oh, dear friends, the kingdom of God is a place of education. It's a place of productivity too. Around the world, there are nations with natural resources. They have something to sell. There are nations with none. Some of the smaller nations with absolutely no natural resources, some of them have decided, well, their only product is their brains. And so, if they have the means, they try to educate as much as they can to make an impression, to sell intellectual property and design and created creation to the world in some way. Every nation strives to have something to produce, some productivity. In the kingdom of God, the main produce, and it's achieved in men and women by the work of the Spirit of God, is righteousness. And praise to God. And converts. And care of souls. This is the produce of the kingdom of God. The eternal, the important things. 
and good works. That's why you look at the world today and the medical profession and the hospitals and everything you can think of and education itself and everything that's good and solid and commendable has all been brought into the world at some point by the Church of Jesus Christ, by Christians working. This is the productivity of the kingdom of God, mainly spiritual things, praise and worship and bringing others into the kingdom, but also the greatest impression for good in this sin-sick and dying world while it lasts. The produce of the kingdom of God, love for God and good works. The kingdom of God is a place of safety. The ideal kingdom is, isn't it? If you're a citizen in the ideal kingdom, you look for safety. They'll have defense systems, something to protect their borders, and you're safe in the kingdom of God, and in the kingdom of God alone, you are eternally safe. You've come to Christ, you've repented of your sin, you've asked for conversion, God has dealt graciously with you, you will never be lost. Your soul is now safe and secure for all eternity. The safety of the kingdom of God. Not all the forces on earth can take you away from God or cut you off from his love. The kingdom of God is a place of happiness. Happiness and peace and certainty and assurance all these things, you've got new life, you've got eternal life, you've got understanding, you've got a new nature, you've got communion with God, you've got guidance from God, you've got answers to your prayers, all these things you have in the kingdom of God. Of course, it'll be a place of great happiness and happiness in learning of God and understanding him and his purposes and in communion with him. It's all these things, the kingdom of God. Now let me look at it as we move to conclusion in a slightly different way. How may I enter the kingdom of God? Using the analogy, comparing it with earthly kingdoms, how may I enter? Well, if you wish to enter an earthly kingdom, you've got to come in through some port of entry. You've got to cross its frontier. You've got to be admitted. There's an immigration system. There are visible frontiers, visible, tangible points of entry. You've got to come in via those. It's not like that with the kingdom of God. There is no visible point of entry. The point of entry is something you see in your mind's eye by faith. It's Christ suffering and dying on Calvary. That is the place where you enter the kingdom of God. You don't go to some place where the cross of Christ has been physically preserved. No, it's in your mind. You believe in Christ. You believe he suffered and died. He is the only entry point because I cannot deserve to get in. You can get in to a reasonably prosperous nation on earth by having the right trade, the right qualifications. That may get you in. If you have some deserving, some merit, some money perhaps, if you tell them you want to invest two million pounds, three million dollars in the country, that'll count very much in your favor. That's official. If you've got something to buy your way in, deserve the way in, your way in, you happen to be an expert in a profession which is badly needed, that may get you in. There's nothing like that in the kingdom of God. You have no merit for God. Everything you've done on earth, even good things, are valueless for getting into the kingdom of God. Your sin record stands against you. Your fallen heart and nature, with all its pride and its deceitfulness and its stains and warts, you can't get in there. You cannot earn or deserve your win. That's why you have to come in 
by way of Jesus Christ suffering and dying on a cross. I see him, I believe in him. He suffered and died for a sinner like me. He bore away all the punishment for my sins if I believe in him. He has promised to forgive freely all who come to him. I will approach him sincerely by faith. I will come in repentance and trust him. That's the way in. And dear friends, it's the only way in. He must purchase your admission. You can't see the frontier of the kingdom of God. Here in this church tonight, if the frontier of the kingdom of God were by some strange means to appear, let us suppose as a kind of fluorescent line, where would it pass? Well, it would come in. It would include this person, exclude that person, go round another person, this person is in, that person is not in, this person is in. It would weave around all over the place because the kingdom of God is among you. It isn't all of you. Are you in? Are you out? It's an invisible to us line. But God knows who's in and God knows who's out. And to come in, you must come in via Calvary, by sincere repentance, by believing in what Christ has done on Calvary's cross. And you know, dear friends, here's something else. To come into a kingdom on earth, our country is like this. We use very flamboyant terms. We say to somebody, you can have permanent residence. We say to somebody, you can have indefinite leave to remain. Or we naturalize and all this kind of thing. Now there's a stamp and you have a right to remain. That's big talk. Actually, no government can really do that. Our government cannot let you permanently into Britain. It cannot let you permanently because we're all only here for a short period. We're all only temporary citizens, whether we like it or not. It's big talk from any government, which it cannot carry out. Here for a season, then gone. Because life is short and life is vain. So they ought to amend all the stamps and all the terms. Permanent residence is no such thing. It's for as long as you live or this life endures or survives. But we're talking about the kingdom of God. That alone gives you permanent residence. That alone gives you right of abode, an everlasting citizenship. Here's all the difference in the world. Stamped on your heart, you become a child of God, a citizen of the eternal kingdom of heaven. Are you in, dear friend? Or are you out? These are wonderful things. And when you're let into this country, or any country, as a citizen, that's all you are, a citizen. I'm very sorry if you're seeking admission, nobody's going to say, you can come in as a lord. Or you can come in as a royal. Or something like that. That'll never happen. You come in as an ordinary citizen. And you are expected to earn your bread and to make your own way and be no burden to your new state. You may be very unfortunate and get very sick and you may have to lean upon your new state. But the deal is you come into work to earn to support yourself. You're on your own, even though you're in a new country. That's how it works. But with the kingdom of God, it isn't like that. You come in as a child of God, as a son of the Most High. Doesn't mean you're divine, of course. You're still a creature made by God, but you've got great status. You're a child of the living God. You're a prince or a princess in the kingdom of God. You have access to the king, the living God. He has great and enduring affection for you and embraces you. His eye is ever upon you and ever with you.
Oh, dear friends, are you in or are you not in the kingdom of God? Invisible frontier. You come in on your knees. You come in by believing in Christ and Calvary and the only way of forgiveness of sin. Don't bring any qualifications or any money thinking that will get you into the kingdom of God. Into the kingdom of God you come only as a refugee. A refugee from the land of sin and condemnation, seeking mercy and new life. You come in by spiritual birth. Christ sees you, he reads your heart, he knows if you're sincere, and he is the one who takes you in under his wing. Do you have a repentant heart? Do you depend on the cross of Calvary alone and the forgiveness of Christ? Will you yield your life to him? Will you let him put the stamp of his likeness upon you and mould you and change you? then you can come. And one last comment. Here's your passport. It's very simple. It's the promises of Christ. For instance, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's your passport. I can approach him. I can call upon him for new life and salvation. This is my invitation, the very promise of Christ, that anyone who comes with a burdened heart, burdened with sin, longing for forgiveness, may come in and be saved and changed. That's the message of the kingdom of Christ. And I close by reading the text. When he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. It isn't a material kingdom to be seen. Neither shall they say, lo, here or lo, there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you, among you, and inside every individual who comes to Christ. Let's pray together. Oh God, our gracious heavenly Father, Look upon us all, we pray and bless us. Draw people to Christ, even in this congregation tonight. Make this place a place of great mercy. Make it a place where people receive life from thyself. Make it a place where Christ is trusted and depended upon. Oh, come and touch our hearts and bring young and old alike to thyself. We ask it in the name of Christ, for his sake. Amen.